My 20s was all about this impending doom of my realization that I was not normal. Hi, I'm Gracie Mercedes, and welcome to the season one finale of Not Blank Enough, a podcast about everyday insecurities and triumphs. In this episode, I'm talking with the one and only Jonathan Van Ness from Queer Eye, the Emmy-nominated TV personality, New York Times best-selling author, and hairstylist to the stars, talks all about his upbringing in rural Quincy, Illinois, the struggles of his 20s, rehab and recovery, and how he landed the gig on Queer Eye. All this and so much more on this finale episode that we titled Not Calm Enough. And stay tuned for a season one afterthought from me after the interview. Jonathan, thank you and welcome to Not Blank Enough. I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm so excited to talk to you too. This is such an exciting day and it's just such a exciting time to be alive. Well, thank you for being on the show. I mean, usually I start off by talk, talking about how I know the person who I'm interviewing. Sometimes I know them, sometimes I don't. And you and I met in real life at our mutual friend Dave Holmes' birthday party years ago. This was actually even before Queer Eye, I think. I mean, maybe you shot it by then, but it wasn't out yet. Mm-mm. Oh no, it was very pre that. Yeah. And I remember like meeting you and we like instantly connected and kind of ignored the rest of the party for about an hour and just chatted about everything. It sounds like the beginning of this podcast. I can't stop talking when I'm around you. I don't know what happens to me. (laughs) I love it. I love it. And so then we kind of just became Instagram friends and Queer Eye happened and now you're like a huge star and I love it. And you're so freaking fantastic in everything you do. By the way, I read your book and I loved it and cried. Before this podcast, I read your book, but I read it right when it came out, but I loved it. So I want to get into you and your life. Usually we talk about like the beginnings of our guests. So like where you're from, tell our audience where you're from and anything they might not know about you and your upbringing. I really didn't leave too much a stone unturned in that book about where I come (laughs) from. um, I'm from a, a town in West Central Illinois called Quincy. I like to say that if you imagine the shape of Illinois, the west side of it looks like a pregnant person. So we're like right where the belly button would be uh, of like in Quincy. So we're like five hours southwest of Chicago. It's a very agriculture based place. I'm so grateful to have experienced what I experienced coming from Quincy in retrospect, because as Mm -hmm. much as I felt trapped and was obviously very ostracized and, you know, like bullied you know, very extensively, definitely survived my my bit of hardships, which I think created like a very tumultuous 20s. But I do think that my sense of like loyalty and my sense of like an ability to process joy and extreme sorrow at the same time, mm. not necessarily in the same moment, but like in the same day, in the same, you know, cycle of, you know, mm-hmm. time windows, I think comes from the fact that I had like an incredibly uncomfortable first 17 years. <laughs> So I'm grateful for, I think that that gave me a lot of character. Mm. And also the people, the people of small town and rural America is like full of so many amazing people that Mm. we don't hear about as much because of a lot of like stereotypes and narratives about small town and rural America, but they're just such, you know, incredible people there. Yeah. And and so did you feel any sort of support during that time from anyone particular back then? Lots of people at different times. I mean, my mom, I think, gave me like so much support in every way that she could. And we like, I mean, I love my mom so much and we're so similar. um, And in other ways, we're so different. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think she gave me so much support and I wouldn't be here, you know, without her support. And also like different educators. I mean, like Kathy Dooley and, and Queer Eye and other orchestra teachers and like gymnastics teachers and just neighbors, different friends, different family members. I think I always had like a source of support. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I definitely would not have gotten through what I went through without having different pockets of support. Right. So yeah, I definitely experienced some really good support there, but that didn't change that I was like also really desperate to get out. Yeah. So let's talk about the theme of the show, not blank enough. In these younger years, what was that blank for you? I feel like my feedback was always too much. It was always about like, (laughs) you know, pulling it back. I feel like masculine comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Calm or masculine. (laughs) Not calm enough or masculine enough. I love it. Yeah. And and expand on that feeling. Like, it's funny when I talked to Dave Holmes, our friend, he was on the show. 
he talked about not feeling manly enough. That ended up being the, the name of his episode. And I'm sure there are probably a lot of gay men who go through a, a period of that, especially in their adolescence and youth. So what was that like for you? I wonder how different that might have been for Dave. Well, it's interesting. So I got to do Dave's hair for years, and I <laughs> love Dave so much. I mean, growing up watching MTV, obviously, like, obsessed. Right. He was also, like, inviting me to do, like, my first, like, you know, version of as close to, like, stand-up of what I ever did before I actually started doing stand-up. Mm -hmm. And, like, he's like, you are a storyteller. You're a comedian. And, like, you know, Margaret Cho told me that, and I was like... No, I just want to be your hairdresser. And then Dave <laughs> Holmes told me that. And I was like, no, I just want to be your hairdresser. And then by the time they both got me like on stage, I was like, okay, maybe I'm going to try. I think I'm, I think like if Dave Holmes and like Margaret Cho think I can do it, like, maybe I can. And I mean, I'm of course. literally not kidding. I really, they really, both of those people give me so much confidence. But he's from St. Louis. And so I'm from Quincy. So that's only, you know, like two hours away. And so mm. geographically, like we're like, you know, going to St. Louis, like to go to like the mall or like to go to like a Cardinals game was a much more like readily available, like family trip than like Chicago, because that was like five and a half, six hours away. And St. Louis was like two. So I was mm. so much more familiar with like a St. Louis you know, Missouri vibe than a uh, Chicago one because I'm from, you know, really close to where Dave is from. So I think there is so much internalized misogyny and so much internalized homophobia. I didn't, I didn't come out and, and really understand my gender nonconforming uh, gender identity until, you know, really like 2018. And when I was doing Dave's hair and living in LA, I don't think that at that time, even though I was like, wearing a heel and and wearing a lot of clothes that I wear now just not as labely cuz my checking account was like in a really different place <laughs> but I didn't understand like gender nonconformity I didn't understand mm -hmm. non-binary I didn't understand a gender spectrum at all and I think so largely the reason that I didn't understand it it was because so many of my peers in the gay community like really like didn't honor that there was like no space for that and it was like very much like especially because in my kind of coming of age in that time, it was like all about like gay.com and like grinder and scruff. And it was all about like sexual connection. And I think mm. that for, you know, so many gay men, which I very much identified as, you know, a gay man at the time, that sense of rejection from being so queer identified, just being so, being so feminine and mm. that being such an organic part of me was something that was just looked down upon, like really not embraced. And so I think for so much of my, and, and really that creates so much internalized misogyny and so much mm. internalized homophobia and men and toxic masculinity. And it took me a long time to kind of know what those things were. Mm -hmm. So then I was just like, I'm just a yoga teacher who wears tights and tank tops with heels and, but I'm, that's all. And I think <laughs> it took me like years to understand, to be like, wait, no, I, I don't identify as a man. I don't really feel that is who my truth is. I think some days I, I guess I can identify more with like a masculine in air quotes energy and feel mm -hmm. more in that sort of like sun side. And mm -hmm. other days I feel much more moon. And then, and then I think at some point I just realized I was like, this isn't for me. Like having to decide like this or that, like none of this is for me. Like this entire mm -hmm. conversation of like, of a binary is just, I don't feel that I belong to that. Cisgender women have never fully accepted me into like what that truth was. Mm -hmm. I never really felt like I was trapped inside my body. I never, tr I never, like I didn't have gender dysmorphia, which is very real. And right. so, but I didn't feel like that's what I was. And then I really don't feel like a man. I feel really attracted to men and people <laughs> that are, cause also, cause also I think another thing that I've realized at this point in my life is that like, if I fell in love with a man and then he, cause like, I also like was in rehab with this like stunning trans man who like, mm. I didn't like, I like when he told me he was trans, I was like, really? I <laughs> like, I would, I like had like no obsessed. So, yeah. well, not only no idea, but also just like, I just think I'm attracted to men but I don't identify as a man. Right. That's kind of where my internal conversation and dialogue is at this point. So it's more like an attraction to a person and not a box that they check, basically. Yeah. But I feel like whether it's like, you know, women, trans women, like then I'm more of like, oh my God, like let's go shop for heels and like can I finger wave <laughs> your hair? And like, 
like, who are we dating? What are we doing? Right. I think just, like, sexuality is interesting. Gender is interesting. And honestly, I just think that in, in when you, you know, what's the question of, like, how is it for me growing up? I think it was really isolating in terms of those conversations. No one's having those conversations. Right. An alien on an island, yeah. A lot of these labels didn't even exist, right? When, when you yeah, were I mean, no yeah. one ever. I mean, there was very like like offensive transphobic labels for everything. Mm-hmm. A very like rudimentary understanding and com- constant conflation too of like sexuality and then gender expression. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't really. It took me like so long to like untangle what all of those meant. Right. And it wasn't fun all the time, but at least I got into cheer, and I was, you know, I had I had I had some fun times. Um, but also a lot of really daunting times. Yeah, interest. <laughs> well, I do want to say everyone should go out and read your book because I did absolutely love it. And I was so touched by it. And you were so brutally honest in it, which I really respected. And like, I remember being, I was in bed with my husband, Damien, and I just started crying. And he's like, are you okay? <laughs> I was like, yeah, this is just such a great book. And I was just like, I want everyone to read this. And so, okay, so now this is, that was childhood. That was like your teenage life. Talk about a little bit, like now you're older, you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, your uh, evolution, when you moved to LA, like what you did and how you were feeling then. I mean, my 20s were really kind of like me dealing with like not yet diagnosed PTSD and a really intense escalating issue with drugs and sexual compulsivity that was like, I was like, oh my God, what's going on? And also made me feel super isolated and alone. Um, through lots of like therapy and healing, I've realized like how common it is and how much so many people go through everything that I've been through, mm-hmm. sometimes more, sometimes less, but you know, lots of different iterations of being a survivor of sexual abuse and also being someone who's in recovery. So my 20s was all about, and I talk about this in my book a lot, like this impending doom of my realization that I was like not normal. And like really wanting to be normal and mm. and being in this like constant conflict of like, because when I would try to go out with my friends mm. and would try to go out and like, you know, just go have some drinks and go dance. And if someone has some blow, it's like, maybe I'll do a little. It's like, it'll be fine. Like, it's right. all fine. And then like four days later, I'm naked in a corner mm. and I did a whole bunch of stuff that like I don't feel great about. And so, Mm -hmm. and so then like, as I got a little older, I was like, okay, then I had to like learn how to say no. And like, I, you know, can't go out and I'm just Mm -hmm. really going to focus on my like career. And then, but then you meet people who may not understand that and like trying to like navigate how much of my truth do I tell a new friend? How much do I not tell a new friend? And Mm -hmm. like, especially in a place like LA, that was hard. Yeah. I feel like I kind of learned the hard way. And really, I think what I ended up doing was like really focusing on therapy and my career. Mm. Really, and I talk about this in my book, like that was really like the culmination of learning to direct that trauma and that rage from a self-destructive place to a self-acceptance and love place Mm -hmm. that wasn't like an exact switch flip you know it was yeah it takes time yeah and and it's always like a three steps forward two steps back sort of like recovery for me anyway I got it got really dark I got you know I got diagnosed with HIV and when I had like between LA like I was there and then I left and then everything kind of changed my my stepdad passed away and I that was the part that got me that was the part that got me. Yeah, I mean, at 25, it was like I, you know, lost my, lost one of my closest allies and then found out I was positive and then Sergey and the book left me. So it was just like a, uh, uh, It was a lot. Uh, it, was so, <laughs> it was a lot. Oh, it was I was so feeling much. that pain, Jonathan. I was feeling that pain. Uh, 25. Oh, yeah. 25. And you, I mean, that's so young. I feel like when I think back to 25, I'm 42 now. So when I think back to 25, that feels like a freaking lifetime ago. And I think about, you know, <laughs> the not so smart moves I made at that time. I think that's the time you make them. And, you know, yours might have been a little more extreme in certain in certain areas. But that's, I think, 20s. That's what your 20s are for, right? And how lucky to come out of that on the other side and be so fucking great, you know, by the end of it. I literally, I am just so grateful. Yeah. I was talking about rehab with one of my friends who I was in rehab with and we were talking about this other like super duper 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 famous person (laughs) that was like in and out of meetings at the time and everyone knew of them and it was like I think I I was like 23 and 24 at that time and 
one thing that I'm really grateful for in my recovery, and I still have shit that I work on, and I also like still smoke pot. So when I talk about when I'm in my recovery, like I am a huge harm reduction queen. I love harm reduction. So when I say I'm in recovery, it's like I'm in recovery in my sexual sobriety. And I was someone who was like that grinder queen that was just like, Mm -hmm. I think in your 20s, like for me and Lisa, like this is, you know, do whatever you want, like be sex positive as you want. I love that story. However, I did get like a comma in my number, like when I wasn't that like, so I think by a time I was like, you know what, if I ever see a dick again, like it'll be a day too soon. Like if it became about like connection. And, like, human connection. And that became, like, so... And also, like, but don't get me wrong, like, there's still a really horny queen there. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. I feel like that, you know, kind of never goes away. But it did become so much more about connection. And so in my success, I'm, like, I'm so grateful that, like, I'm obsessed with gardening and that I'm, like, obsessed with therapy and that I'm obsessed with, like, a shoe and I'm obsessed with, like, researching things for my podcast. Like, yeah. There's this thing in recovery that we talk about, which is like outer circle behavior, which is like all of the things that you do that like really help. It's like self-care, but it's not like numbing out self-care. It's like stuff that's like, you know, helps you help people and helps you help yourself. Mm -hmm. Here's the big difference. Mm -hmm. Who I was hypothesizing about is someone that's like so, 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 so rich that if they like, they never really have to work again. Mm -hmm. That's not my truth. But if I really wanted to like throw it out the window, I could Mm -hmm. and I don't. Right. And, but it, part of the reason that I do it's like, I just love healing and I love yeah. like helping people. I also love like learning new things. And I'm just so happy that like that self-destructive part, like fucking got scared enough or like yeah. I saw it enough that, you know, we were able to like heal together. And I just, it's so fun that like gardening literally and like having, like feeding my cats and like, <laughs> you know, putting together like a fun look and or like styling my friend's hair like literally gives me as much of a thrill as what doing drugs and having sex with strangers used to do. And that is just so great. I think that is (laughs) just so fun. You look so happy. I love I love seeing your face right now. You have the biggest smile on your face. And I love me love hearing you talk about this. And I get it. I mean, I'm not I don't have the same uh, story, but even just the parallels of like, what made me happy and what I got excited for in my 20s versus now in my 40s. Like, I love a good night's sleep. I love a great meal. Mm. I, love, I love a great hike. And like before it was not that. It was like, get me to the club. I was brought up in New York City. I was like, let's be out till four in the morning, go have breakfast, go to bed at seven. And now the thought of that makes me like, oh God. Okay, well, I do kind of still miss like to party? dancing now that I haven't <laughs> done it for like, not like, I don't miss like the hangover. I don't miss the drug. I definitely feel like from like 31 to the pandemic, I was very much like amazing at like a quarterly Sunday where I would like go to brunch, <laughs> have yes. like two Bloody Marys, mm-hmm. which basically is like halfway to blackout for me at this point in okay. my 30s. Like that's right. like that is as turned up as I yep. can really be as like as two Bloody Marys. And then like in New York, like there's always a place that you can find that's got like some music on like a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And so just like I love like, you know, having like had two Bloody Marys and having been dancing and being home by six o'clock at night Mm -hmm. to watch Bake Off. Oh, my God. (laughs) But that's what I mean. That's what I mean. It's like the like now I love having two to three cocktails and three I'm done. Like I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm so nice at three and then yeah, going dancing, but I still want to be home in bed by, by like midnight is late for me. Yeah. I have to be home to feed my cats. Right. That's, like with four cats, I feel like at some point with four, four cats. Oh my God. It does like almost equal a human. Cause like if you, if I feed them too late or too early, like it fucks up mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like literally it fucks up everything. Like mm-hmm. they'll be, clawing and pawing at night and like <laughs> like I call it yowling because it comes like from their like deep deep tum tums like because yeah. they get so hungry they're like oh at like four <laughs> in the morning you know and you know how like people will say with cats like oh like I love a cat because you can like leave them all leave weekend them alone, yeah. and then the, you can't do that like that cats don't fucking like that you mm-hmm. have to like play with them and they need enrichment and the reason why a lot of times cat like people's cats are like naughty and like scratch shit up is because they don't have any they don't have anything to play Mm, with like they need mm -hmm, enrichment mm -hmm. um so but anyway so they're very much 7 30 7 30 7 30 7 30 a.m 7 30 p.m got it all right jonathan i'm gonna move you off of cats now okay okay yeah my bad yeah back back to jonathan and his life so real quick the 20s 
that was kind of like the time for rebirth. What was your not blank enough then? Just not not present enough. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so much sadness. Like my stepdad had, you know, really severe like bladder cancer and watching someone that you love so much like over the course of three years like go through that was like so intense and also I love my mom so much and she loved him so much so watching you know watching them fight that together for that long and then you know like a year after Steve passed away my mom got ovarian cancer and so it was just like so much that also that was you know her illness was kind of what also kind of helped me because I realized I couldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. Like I had to be there for my mom. Like she didn't, like I needed to get myself together. As hard as it was to watch her again, I was just like, I knew that I needed to, I just kind of shaked my head to say like snap myself out of it. That's also not an accurate representation because it's, I did not willpower myself out of it. Right. Like it was a lot of rehab. It was a lot of therapy. It continues to be a lot of therapy. Um, Yeah. Let's go into Queer Eye. And how that mm. came about and how amazing that show is and what all that was like. Oh my gosh. So I first heard that it was being rebooted when I was in New York and it was right after Trump had won. Mm-hmm. It was like November of 2016. And I heard that they were rebooting it and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like meant to be on that show. But they had already done a lot of auditions. And so, but I still got my foot in the door to go see this meeting. And so I went to one of the casting people at ITV here in New York. And I had been down at Arte Salon, which is the salon that I worked at when I was living between New York and LA. And like from like 2015 to 17. I love that salon. It's so pretty. So if there's anyone in New York and Shereen's amazing there. Everyone's amazing there, but I love Shereen. She just did my hair like two months ago <laughs> and she gave me like the best bob ever. But so I was like covered in like men's haircuts because I'd been doing like men's haircuts all day that day. And I just like was covered in clippings. (laughs) And then I went to this, like I went to this audition to meet this person and I was like, I'm never going to get this. I look insane. Just like in my New York, like all black garb and like all St. Boot and um, very like no nonsense. And I remember saying to her, she was like, what do you want to see from this queer eye? And I was like, it needs to be diverse. And I like didn't skip a beat. I was just like, it needs to be diverse. I was like, our community has come so far. And I was like, I look up to the original Fab Five so much. I was like, I love Cayenne. I have Jay Rodriguez, Jay Rodriguez's signed headshot underneath my childhood bed, <laughs> which is true. So I was like, I love the original Fab Five, but I do hope if anything else, whether or not I'm in it or not, I really hope that it's super diverse because we have come such a long way and I don't ever want to hear the term metrosexual ever again for as long as I live. That would be my goal. Yes. And she was like, Okay, and I was like, I'm never going to see these people or hear from them (laughs) ever again. And, you know, we chatted for like another 20 minutes. I also thought I was for sure not going to get them to call me back because when I arrived, my phone was dead. And I like talked the front desk lady's ear off about like letting me charge it because I didn't have a charger. So I was like, I arrived with like a dead phone. I was like, oh, she's totally going to tell her like how annoying I was. (laughs) But she didn't. And I did get a call back. So then I got a call back. Also, Game of Thrones totally saved my butt because one of, like, the, like, works with the creator of the show Mm -hmm. and works at Scout Productions. Um, His name is Eric, and I love him so much. But he knew me from Game of Thrones. I got that one call back, and then I met them, and we did, like, a recorded Skype interview. And then from that was this, like, 40-person, like, Glendale ballroom, like, mass. Yeah, I remember reading about this in your book. It, it was very much like that last episode of like ANTM when there's like, you know, 40 girls, but only like 12 go into the right. house. It was like that, but only five spots. So the pressure was really on. I really tried hard to not compare my entire life to America's Next Top Model for every second <laughs> of that entire audition process, but I wasn't successful. Right. I really wasn't. By the last day of it, when I knew who the top 10 was, There was this point when they said, I think I talk about this in the book. I can't remember. That book was like 60,000 words. I think I wrote like 200,000 words. And now that it's been like, now that it's been like a year, like I can never remember. I'm like, what What was I end up like? Yes, I always like forget. (laughs) But, um, and and like once you edit a memoir, you're like, I never want to look at that again. (laughs) And I'm I'm not like that anymore. I feel like I got through that. But Mm. writing that and editing it was like such a difficult process. I was like, I need a breather. 
I do feel like my brain turned into a broken record of America's Next Top Model that, like, final day, I was like, I am not here to make it friends with anyone. <laughs> and, like, I had been trying to be, like, really nice to, like, everyone. And, like, because, like, the first, like, couple days, like, everyone was so sweet to each other and they were, like, respective, like, you know, vertical. Like, I loved all the grooming people and I also, like, really loved all the culture people. By the time it was top 10, I was like, this is not America's Next Top Best Friend competition. And if, my if I fucking try to make friends with you, I'm going to feel bad when I'm in there slaying this competition. Right. So I need to focus. And so I went to Starbucks and I got my little coffee. And then they were like, all right, so we're going to go to this like house. And they did like two mock episodes. And I just remember thinking like, girl, this is your fucking long program. And it's stacked with triple triples. You got seven <laughs> triples planned in this program and you cannot double foot one of them. And so it just was... Oh my God, I had heartburn for like five days. And also at the time I was living in Los Feliz and I had just discovered that blue 22 or something or like blue spoon something like the blue spoon diner. And I was living off of these like boneless chicken wings and then like a <laughs> chocolate chip pizza cookie. Like what? the, like those like pizookies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just ordering that like every night and just like from, and just like stress eating it and then just having horrific heartburn like all day. <laughs> Were you like, um, I feel like I read about this. I'm not sure now. I'm like, did I make this up? Were you, um, in your final group? Were there other people who ended up getting picked in that group? It was the, it was four of us. Four of it you. Was wow. Four of the five of us. The only person who wasn't was Anthony. And so were you like, were there any moments where you're like, yeah, I'm going to get it and he's going to get it and he's going to get it? Or did you just only think about yourself? No, I didn't believe it. I I think I knew Karamo was for sure going to get it. I could feel it because he was just, he was so confident. And I mean, he wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get, well, actually he he was like, I'm going to get this. Right. <laughs> um, but I also just like felt his confidence and I believed it. There was like nothing inauthentic about it. And mm. I just was like, oh my gosh, I want to be around him. He's amazing. He's going to, he's amazing. Oh, and then I also felt like that about Tan. I was like, oh, he's going to get it. I felt like he was going to get it for sure, too. Because mm-hmm. he was wearing this fucking camel turtleneck yeah. that was the same, that was like almost the same color as his skin. And it just kept me double taking because I was like seeing his lat through that tight <laughs> turtleneck, honey. And he had these like real, like crisp, like slacks. I like love these like his gray, style. kind of like, yeah. like a grown up slack, mm-hmm, honey. Like it's mm-hmm. like, I was like, oh my God, I could never. But not like in a bad way. Like I, like my brain wouldn't pull together something that chic. So fucking chic. Oh my God, I literally get chills on my thighs thinking about <laughs> his outfit that first day. It was that good. It was so wow. good. But as far as I was concerned, it was a two-day audition at this hotel, right? But then we ended up having to come back later to do more. But I kind of knew, I knew that I was cast like a week later. But the first day of it, there was like eight of us maybe in the grooming category. But they were like, well, there's this one boy who won't be here today. And he has like an automatic like shoe in to tomorrow. And I was like, what? Fuck. I was like, that guy's going to get it. Like, he doesn't have to be here for this first day. Like, he must be major. So I was like, dang. And also, I thought, like, they'd flown in so many people. I was like, well, if they flew in a bunch of people, they're not going to, like, cut a bunch of people on the first day. Right? right, right, right. Like, I was like, I'm sure they'll have, like, everyone come back tomorrow. So when we came back the next day, there was, like, half of us. And I was like, oh, my. I love it. God. They should have done a behind. I mean, maybe they did, but they should have done a behind the scenes. No, they this. didn't. No, they didn't. Only been in our memories. So fun <laughs> to watch. And so it would have been. So then you get the show, and like, what do you think? Did you have any idea it was going to be as huge as it was? I mean, I know the first one was huge, but sometimes when they try to reboot things, they don't work out. Yeah, I think I thought that we shot season one and two together, mm-hmm. and so is that whole time I was like flying back to LA every weekend and doing my clients and. I shot Game of Thrones, you know, through that every weekend. And so I went, like, I was in Atlanta, you know, five days a week and then L.A. Saturday and Sunday, Atlanta, Monday through Friday, L.A. Saturday, Sunday wow. for, like, four months or three months. I never thought I was going to stop doing hair, ever. Like, I was like, I'll always do it at least one day a week, two mm-hmm. days a week. Like, all, like I know I, I'll always do it. My clients are like, no, girl. And I was like, no, you, girl. I'm going to, I will be here. And... It was just amazing, but and I hoped that it would continue, but I definitely didn't think I had any, like, guarantees. Right. We had the most amazing crew and the most amazing producers, and I remember in season one and two, there was people that were on our crew that was like, this is something special. Like, we've been living in Atlanta for years. We've been seeing reality shows for years. Like, this is special, and I've always had a hard time taking compliments, and I've learned a lot how to take them better from the show and really from 
my friends and and from our own advice, I feel like I've taken some of our own advice, mm -hmm. which is part of like why I wrote the book. So I was like, you know, we always say to people like, be brave and like own your truth and, right. you know, variations of that. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like my turn to be brave and own mm -hmm. my truth. And I didn't have any idea that it was going to be as big as it is. And I always have just incredibly surreal, is this me? Like, is this happening? Like right. when we presented an Emmy comes to mind, looking out on that audience and seeing like a teleprompter and then meeting fucking Nancy Pelosi and, and then not only like meeting with her, but like literally lobbying her about like access to prep. Like that was later wow. was incredible. And then meeting with AOC and Nancy Pelosi together with the five or the, I think that was four of us, but we just had such amazing. I mean, we went to Japan together. We just have had so many like amazing life experiences that are beyond anything that I could have ever, mm. ever, ever thought, ever. It's just really incredible. I mean, it's just such a beautiful show because you you all feel so real and honest. And it doesn't feel like just like five hosts or five quote unquote experts kind of trying to tell people how to dress or how to live their lives. It feels like five people who are genuinely being honest and opening themselves up, which is why, I mean, granted, I am a sensitive person who cries a lot, but I literally cry almost every episode. I've seen all the episodes. I literally cry almost every episode because I'm always so touched by the people you guys um, pick as, as your, as your makeovers. And it's really a beautiful thing. And that's why the show's is so successful because it's, it's real, it's honest. And it's something we have especially needed in the last four years, you know? And I think, I think you mentioned this in the book, but the original Fab Five was during the Bush administration. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was from 2003 to seven. Which is interesting. Not that the Bush administration was anything like the Trump administration, but I, I, I get the sentiment behind it. And so, man, bravo to you and all, and all the guys. I mean, our producers are so incredible and the creator of the show, David Collins, and Scout Productions is amazing. And the support that we have from the team at, at ITV and Netflix really is, I mean, they're amazing. It's more than the five of us. And also our heroes are just to let like so many people in your home and, and to be that vulnerable is just like, yeah, it's not easy. I think, I think I, I'm always like so impressed by our heroes. Yeah. I love that you call them heroes. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, I think just think, I mean, that's such a, that was also like not our creation. Like that was David Collins creation, but it's, it, it's like, we don't celebrate the heroicness of literally just making it like, and so mm -hmm. to be, you know, um, to be, I mean, literally like, Oh my God, we really don't celebrate like the heroicness that lies in all of us. Yeah. Okay. Well, closing up on things, how are, how's Jonathan feeling today? I know you said you have a lot of projects going on that you can't talk about, which I totally get, but what is your not blank enough today? I don't know. I'm really relieved about aspects of the election <laughs> and I'm really happy that we were able to get someone who is like attempting autocratic breakthrough, like away from that football shaped, like nuclear briefcase that the president has. So I'm really excited that we, uh, you know, diverted that when Barack won in 2008, I was not as politically engaged as I am now. Mm. And I just think collectively, you know, in 2010, that was like one of, it was the largest loss of democratically held seats in state legislative races and in governors, the Congressional House and the Senate ever, there was like a thousand Democratic seats that were lost in that midterm. Mm -hmm. And I think if we've learned anything from last year, we, well, we've learned a lot last year, this year. Oh my God, it's not the next year yet. If we've learned <laughs> anything from this year. Yeah. It's that we know the power of protest in, in local change mm -hmm. and affecting like local budgets, putting pressure on our mayors, putting pressure on our city councils. So I think I was surprised that we were unable to flip any more state houses than we did, that we weren't able to grow our majority that in the way that, you know, we thought we were going to. And I've also been really a little concerned since, you know, they announced the election that there's been this knee-jerk reaction to, like, blame progressives and blame Black Lives Matter. And there's been these, like, Claire McCaskills and John Kasichs that have said, like, oh, like, you know, the left is what almost cost Biden. It's like, no, that's why you won. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why Ohio, John Kasich, you did not do anything. Missouri, Claire, come on. Like, work your MSNBC deal. Like, no. Like, it, the, and to, I was venting about this on Instagram today. I don't know when this episode is going to come out, but 
This guy said to me something really smart that I've never heard anyone say before. He said that Republicans run towards their base and Democrats run away from it. Mm. How are we going to change that? Right. Minimum wage was voted to raise to $15 in Florida. They voted to restore voting rights to people who that have had felonies mm-hmm. in 2018. Like, there's so much progressive energy on the ground, but it seems to me that there's really this, like, inability of, like, the Democratic Party as a whole to, like, be able to reach through and, like, talk to voters. It does feel like the right caters to their their party, whereas the left tries to cater to the right and get them over to us while leaving the people who are already on the left kind of behind. Yeah. Something they really need to work on for sure. And with all due respect, it's like we had John Kasich on that Democratic National Convention. I saw a lot of eating ice cream. I saw a lot of like, (laughs) I didn't see any explanation of what defunding the police actually means. I don't even, I didn't see a mention of it. I didn't see any talk about like the problems that we really face when it comes. I mean, some of them it's like in this way where it's like about making people comfortable, but like really we just need to have conversations that are going to be uncomfortable for people that are just now realizing. Right. 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 Yeah. I think I'm just like concerned. Like I'm excited, Mm -hmm. but I'm also like a little concerned for like, I really want us to be able to all come together and, and maybe not concerned. I think I'm, I'm just like curious. Like why is it like two days after we get this called, like, there's this like knee jerk reaction of like, I just didn't see like a blame game coming on so quickly after the election. Right, right, right. And it's still kind of, at least for me, it was very disheartening how many people still voted for Trump. You know, he no longer was an idea. He was someone who actually was a certain way for four years and yet 70 million people voted for him. And and that to me is, it's sad and dis- disappointing, especially as a woman of color. I'm just like, come on, guys, please. And then even worse for like the mm-hmm. Democratic establishment leadership, whatever, even like MSNBC, which I just got turned on to election week because I couldn't take CNN anymore. And my friends are like, oh, watch MSNBC. <laughs> They're literally talking to Claire McCaskill and John Kasich about how the left almost cost them the election. But white turnout white women voted for trump more Mm -hmm. the very people that the people that they're saying like you know you didn't win them over like ohio didn't turn out like more white people voted for trump than he did last time i know it was progressive turnout that really rallied and did this and now you're gonna turn it against come out against yeah what doesn't make sense maybe i'm not energetic enough to go like blow somebody's house down because I'm just so tired. I don't know what it is. I don't know what I am not enough of it of what it is today. Together, usually with my guests, I, I, we decide what we're going to name the episode. So overall, life of Jonathan, um, what would you say you're not blank enough is? Keep in mind sometimes that blank is what kind of empowers you. What 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 was your catalyst for change? So um, anything like that. I don't know. What are we going to name it? <laughs> Jonathan, I did love, and we didn't really talk about it that much, but you did mention feeling um, not calm enough. Do you still feel that? And what is that like? Yeah, it came out really hardcore in the last hour, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just feel like so doing so much, like, but doing it from home. Girl, I, I feel you. I'm, I can't sit still. I'm the kind of person who can't sit still. I always have to be doing something. I started a fucking podcast over COVID just because I needed something to do. So I get it. And I often feel like I can't relax enough or I'm not calm enough. So I get the not calm enough stuff. And I think that can, you talked about self-care and stuff like that. I think sometimes I'm very aware or more hyper aware of the need for self-care and the need to chill the fuck out sometimes. But to me, sometimes that feels like work because I just don't know how to... Part of that, I think they say sometimes women of color or children of immigrants have this feeling of constantly having to hustle and feeling like they have to earn relaxing. And so I don't know if that's part of my story or my narrative, but I'm curious to to hear what you think about about it for you. I think I feel like in our last election, like I so badly like wanted a bigger platform. Like in my Game of Thrones days, I was like, oh my gosh, if I could reach more people, like Mm. I would do this and I would do that. And I would, and then like I kind of, got one and and then I think you know becoming successful it's like I just have said yes like yes 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 and so it's work for me I think it's like a fear of like saying no and so that's been a lot to learn how to but also it's like something I've been learning about recently is that like the difference between like numbing out and self-care I think I was having issues conflating those two things sometimes Mm -hmm just generally like I'm so excited to see you and I was so excited to just like see you and catch up and whenever I haven't seen someone for a long time who I like it makes me talk like 16 times more (laughs) and I already talk a lot I don't think you talk too much 
This is about you. This is your interview. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like maybe it's because I'm used to like hosting a podcast, but I feel like I talked for 95% of the time and I think you talked for like 5% of the no, time. No, and that's good. That's it. a good thing. People know this is going to be our finale episode, by the way. So this is 25 episodes in and people have heard me talk for 25 episodes. They know who I am at this point and we wanted to get to know you better. So thank you for, for doing this and being here. We're going to call it Not Calm Enough. I love it. That feels... <laughs> very accurate (laughs) (laughs) okay well thank you jonathan thank you so much gracie all right guys well that is a wrap on season one 25 amazing guests that i have the privilege to get to know better people from all walks of life that truly represent the beautiful diversity that exists all around me and all around this world really i feel very honored that they shared their stories with me and and all of us. And I really hope that you enjoyed any and all interviews that you listened to. But most importantly, I hope that they made you feel seen. Not Blank Enough was a passion project that came to me during the early months of COVID lockdowns and the Black Lives Matter protest. I was feeling detached and lonely and sad, and I wanted to connect with others. So I really felt a pull to do something about it. And that's when I came up with the idea of a podcast where I would just talk to guests about their insecurities and their triumphs, something that we all have in common and could all connect on. And the result was 25 intimate, intriguing, funny, and fascinating conversations where my guests were brutally honest and self-reflective. In all of this, I learned so much, so much about them and so much about myself, and I hope you did too. So I look forward to more talks in the new year. But for now, I'm going to savor these conversations and I will work on spreading them to even more people. And I just wanted to sincerely thank you for listening. It really means the world to me that you took any time out of your day to listen to these conversations. So thank you for listening. And until next time, remember that you are more than enough. We will be back with season two in February of 2021. Oh, one more thing. If you have listened to any episode and have liked it, please, please, please consider giving it a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Reviews are super important and really helpful in getting this podcast to more people. So yeah, if you have listened to any episode and enjoyed it, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you again. Until next time for real this time. Check the show notes for links and info about today's guest. Follow us on Instagram at notblankenoughpod. This episode was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 and recorded remotely. Our show is executive produced by Gracie Mercedes and Dave Hill and produced by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Not Blank Enough is a Gumption Pictures production.